Hello, wonderful humans, and welcome back to my channel, Board Game Dads. My name is Anthony, and today I have an extremely special type of episode for you. It is May, and we are doing here a Board Game Moms Takeover, where the moms are in charge, and I've got my first <laughs> guest, Board Game Mom, Callie Potter. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to have someone on from the Instagram community. I'm you excited are, to be here. We love Instagram busy. and all the members. <laughs> yeah, you're busy over there. You have a lot of cool, a lot of cool photos going on, and a lot of stuff that we were just kind of talking about before recording. Uh, you know, it's it's cool to see other people's interests sometimes when you know the main vein that you have in common is the board game stuff, right? But then when you see a little bit of a glimpse into some other hobbies uh, or interests, that's always fun. You're always posting stuff about uh, delectable desserts around <laughs> your area, right? Uh, yes. You've got your, your donuts and cookies and things like that, but you balance it out. There's always got to be a healthy variety. So we've got the garden going with it. <laughs> That's right. And and having a garden, by the way, in the Arizona heat is, is no small feat. So I applaud you yes. for that. <laughs> well, we'll see as people follow that journey, whether or not it survives the Arizona heat. It looks great in March. <laughs> it looks cool. Yeah, you got quite a nice little structure out there. So So there's that. Um, so yeah, like I said, we have a board game moms take over here. We want to get a perspective from the other side. And as it were, we usually, um, when it's Eric and I doing a holiday spotlight, we tend to bring two games each to the table because this is such a special occasion and we're celebrating the mom so much. We're going to go ahead and do three games each. I know it's craziness. Uh, but before we get into the main topic and those games, we're going to talk to Callie a little bit and, um, we want to know basically what is your board game origin story how did you get into this hobby that we love so much always a good one so i grew up really lucky that i grew up with my grandparents so they're texans so we love the dominoes we love the cards growing up but really like everybody for the most part Catan was that game um, we were living in Kansas. Um, my husband's going to grad school, so we just didn't have really any board games out there. And somebody showed up with Settlers of Catan one time, and it just blew our minds. We went a little nuts. So then we got it, and living in student housing, I mean, nobody has money anyway, so whoever has that thing is where everybody goes. So right. we became the Settlers of Catan House, and you know, <laughs> that main game then leads to expansions because you need more people, which sure. then leads to, you know, have to get seafarers, have to get cities and nights, have to, you know, do all the things. And that just kind of started our craze. But really, we had, we had to do, I mean, Amazon wasn't a thing. So yeah. we had to wait until we came back home to visit. And my brother-in-law from Utah would bring us games that we'd order from, they had all kinds of board game stores up in Provo. So we just kind of slowly but surely every Christmas added to that pile. And then Amazon came in, the rest is history, because now we just yeah. buy them all the time. <laughs> it's it's hard not to, right? Especially when there seems to always be a sale going on one place. Always. <clears throat> bad for our wallets but yeah that's great katan is definitely one that um is is different for people right it definitely takes that next step from like those classic games that you were talking about and adds a, yeah. a much different sort of dynamic um for me it was pandemic which i think is also okay. a lot of people's probably answer to that question um same thing like you said just the whole concept of it kind of blew my mind right this is a a game where you're playing together with your friends instead of against each other right. you're playing <laughs> against the game. And it was this worldwide pandemic and it just blew my mind. And I was like, I have to go get this game, get this game. Get this game. <laughs> and I did, I did not buy pandemic, oh. but the first guy I did buy was pretty similar in that it was a co-op game. That's flashpoint fire. Okay. Rescue. Um, you know, found it very similar in terms of the special characters. Everyone has an ability and whatnot, and you're playing against the game and, yeah, that was my wormhole from there. And then <laughs> here we are in a game room, right? So right. <laughs> and there's that. So uh, besides... I'm lucky I didn't get introduced to Pandemic first because I'm not a co-op person. Oh. So it's probably lucky. My husband loves co-op games. That's probably our biggest difference in gaming. And I am an every man for himself kind of gal. So <laughs> <laughs> it's lucky I went on the settler's route. <laughs> so you must like games that have a possible traitor then. 
because you can I, I usually do i love yeah. to have some kind of trader or um i'm a big fan of luck factors so okay. you know when we can kind of killer bunny-esque you know where you okay. can do all you can do and at the end of the day it was that luck of the draw that kind nice. of gets it <laughs> So tell me about your family and, um, you know, basically, are they all into the board games with you guys? Um, do some of them not like it so much? How does that work in your house? So I am lucky. I'm married to my handsome hubby. Um, he loves board games. And I'm going to say that's probably the biggest factor that allows at least moms to be big into board gaming is if dad is into board gaming. Because then sure. you're not choosing between game or movie or, you know, things like that. We both love it. Um, I have four kids from 17 to seven, um, and one of them's a girl and then three boys. And I really only have one that loves board games. So he'll play okay. everything with me. Usually when I get a new one, he's the one who I test it out on to see, will games, will kids like this game? Can you teach it? Um, he is 11 now. So okay. it's kind of that mid range, um, with kids. The older kids and stuff, they'll join in. And, um, if the adults are playing it, just, I think to hang out with the adults, but um, they're not necessarily as big into the board games, but my youngest who's seven loves getting board games, trying the new ones. You know, we have to do a little bit younger ones for him, Sure. Um, but he enjoys learning them. And I think it teaches them a lot of, you know, a math skills for a lot of those games and then be, you know, it's learning to win and learning to lose. And that's hard thing for especially seven-year-olds, you know, to yeah. learn. Oh, yeah. But it's hard for, you know, older people, too. You know, I don't I take listen. losing very well either. <laughs> My wife just beat me in a game before this recording. I'm pretty sad about it because she always wins that game. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. There's so many things that are beneficial uh, for children to, to learn yeah. throughout the board gaming thing. You know, like I said, besides just basic counting, scoring points and mm -hmm. things like that, especially with how dynamic some of these games are these days. Oh, there's yeah. just There's these skills that you would never have thought would have been something that wouldn't have been involved there and now there's there's all kinds of ways to teach kids stuff through these games without them being educational games right which right. is incredible uh so yeah that's great i'm glad that uh that your hubby loves the hobby as well uh mm -hmm. same thing in this household and like you said it makes for easier you know planning what do you want to do tonight oh, right. yeah. <laughs> well, do both. great so for the 11 year old how long has he been into the games like how how old was he when he first started so he's really been playing probably into the bigger games since he was eight um we have a lot of friends that they will play games with their kids a lot so we started noticing that but we really never did it was always just kind of like the two of us or when we would get together with friends i never really thought about including the kids okay. or you look at the age on the box and you're like oh that's beyond their capacity but then when this my 11 year old decided he wanted to start playing um i think we started off probably with killer bunnies um was his first game into it and then king of tokyo and then, you know oh, yeah. things like that where he just really the dice games and the easier card games worked and we just kept introducing game after game and he picks up on it really almost faster than some of the adults that you teach games to. <laughs> nice. And they're a little more willing to listen to the rules or the explanations than I think adults are willing to. So he's played for at least the last four years. And he is the, my one where if I get a new one and I'm like, okay, we've got to go through the rules. I need to learn it before I teach some friends. He's always game for that. Oh, that's great. That's great. Because that's another thing that's so vital in in education you know i i was a second grade teacher for many years and um, one of the things that you know of the theory was the the best way for a child to demonstrate understanding of a topic or a skill is for them to be able to teach it to somebody else hmm. right and and being able to teach a board game and teach it well is definitely an art that you need to craft right. over time and that's fantastic that he's into that part with you because that's that's a big challenge especially yes. when the, the games get heavier and more complex for, for sure. sure absolutely great so let's get right into talking about some games here so i gave uh callie several topics to choose from and the one that she decided to focus on today were games that we enjoy to play with our spouse or significant other or basically just one other person um, which is a great topic. I'm glad that you chose that one, actually, because uh, I did an earlier video highlighting National Spouses Day. Uh, oh. My buddy Eric and I did that back in probably January, I think. Uh, but we weren't really doing this 
pick two games each kind of format back then. So we had a little bit of a different thing going on. So I was glad to revisit this topic and come up with some some new games for that. So we're going to go ahead and go ahead and start right with your first pick. What's the first game you enjoy playing with your husband? Well, I thought I would kind of take it in a different direction as opposed to just two player games and pick games mm-hmm. that could be two players. So the first one I did was, and you can't even see on the camera, but I'll say it, it's the Star Realms series. So that's a deck building um, card game series. And I didn't get into this one until a little bit later on from when it came out. I think it was already a bigger game. People had already been trying it out. Um, but my husband saw it and he really loved it. And we started playing it and I love that it's a quick explanation. It's an easy setup. We take it when we travel because Mm -hmm. you can take it pretty much anywhere. Um, and you can play a lot of people into the game. I'm not even sure what the, I should actually look and see. It says four players, but I think we've played it with six to eight sometimes. Oh wow. takes a little longer for it to be your turn. Um, but really the game kind of, and we just would lower the, point total count. So instead of having it start at the 40 or the 50, you know, we bring it down to 20 or 30 if there's a lot of people playing and stuff. So I really like it for that reason. I am as for, as a mom, especially when you're trying to like wait for a restaurant or things like that, especially Uh, pre COVID you're sitting outside with the kids, you're waiting for your turn. It's the perfect game where you can bring out, doesn't take a lot of space. And then when they call your name, it's quick, throw it back in the box and you're good to go. That's great. That's great. Never thought about that. Um, now, this is similar to, I haven't played this game, but I know there's a similar one called Hero Realms, right? Do, do you have yes. that one as well? I don't have that one as okay. well, but I have um, heard of it, and it is very similar scale. This one, I think, is just more spaceshipy. It um, yeah. looks very Star Trek-esque, you know, okay. in design. Um, but the whole goal of it, obviously, being, and it's kind of nice, you keep the scores on an app, and you can, you know, up you press up when you lose point gain a point or down when you lose a point but um you're basically you have your base start of cards like a lot of games are and you're just building that deck as you go along trying to get bigger ships trying to get um you have to decide if you're going to spend your time attacking your opponent and lowering their score or protecting yourself so that way they can't lower your own score hmm. and so there's a fine balance as to which cards you purchase and then of course the luck of then when you shuffle that deck and you draw your five cards, what do you start out with? Right, right. Yeah, that's a great the deck building is such a great genre. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it started off with like I guess Dominion and maybe something else that was yes. around the same time when it was just that was the whole game was just the deck building. And now it's in right. part part like a small part of a lot of bigger games. There's like a deck building component to it. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like Star Realms is pretty much like Dominion. It's just kind of just deck building. Very similar. It just yeah. brings it in into much more compact, you know, type box, and you're not having to worry about, you know, the boss or the monster type card. Sure. It's really more just a matter of making sure your opponent doesn't defeat you before you defeat them, kind of thing. And when you play with multiple people, we try to base, you know, it's really just that last man standing of right. you don't want to go too big because if you have this huge battle front in front of you, everyone's coming for you. So right, right. you have to kind of fine tune exactly how deep are you going to go into your zone versus and are you going to attack multiple people or are you going to stick with just going after that one person and when i play with my spouse especially you know i have to kind of watch to see what he's doing because if he's just building himself up then i know that i've really got to work on building myself up because he's going to hurt me if he hits me with some of those ships but if i can catch him in a weak spot where he's you know saving up some of that money or whatnot then you know it's good to go from there Cool, cool. And yeah, the app as well would make it a very easy game to, to take, like you said, in a situation like that. Right? Just yes. Turn, put your phone away and you got your score sheet is, is stored away. Absolutely. It's perfect for that. Cool. All right. So the first game I'm going to talk about here is a two-player only game. Uh, it just recently got reprinted. I eventually might get that one, but I don't have any reason mm-hmm. to do that yet unless this one gets super beat up. And that's Jaipur. Uh, this is a really small game that is basically just cards and tokens. Probably takes up a little bit more room just because there's how many? I think six different uh, types of goods that you're sort of collecting. And so the tokens take up a good amount of room. But basically, this is just a game where you've got a display of cards and you're going to be set collecting, which is, you know, a mechanic that I love a lot because it's so easy to teach and explain to people, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> And in this game, you're just trying to exchange uh, a number of the same amount of of cards for these tokens, and the tokens are worth uh, less points as you go on, right? So that they kind of like diminish in value. 
and then the game's over when I think three of the piles are completely empty. This game is is super quick. In fact, you even are recommended, I think, to play best two out of three uh, whenever you sit down to play this one. Uh, I remember specifically actually was able to teach this one. Speaking of teaching games, we were at a board game cafe one time, and a couple next to us was had open Jaipur, and they were reading the rules and learning. I was like, can I teach them how to play? And I was <laughs> like, yeah, go ahead. I was like, hey, guys, I couldn't help but notice that you're trying to learn Jaipur. I really like this game, and I can teach you pretty quickly how to play. And they were like, great. So Let that. me save you some time. <laughs> yeah, there you, go, there you go. Save some time, get a, maybe get time for another game in later. Uh, but yeah, it's just the, I, I like the simplicity of it. It has enough going on that you're going to think about what decision you want to make. Um, cause you don't necessarily want to always give your opponent some things that are left over. So there's sometimes some hate picking, right? Like I want to take that because <laughs> I think you kind of want it. Have you ever played this one? I have played that one and I really do like it. I am a fan of the art of that one. Um, yeah. I like the, the, how it looks. It looks like more of a game than it really even is. It's, it looks For sure. very pretty and involved, but it is a quick play. And it's like you said, it's a fast one. You know, it takes up a little more table space so you can't necessarily just do it on the run, but yeah, it is yeah. one that you can easily, I think is a good gateway game if you're teaching someone new. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if anybody is familiar with, you know, again, I go back to the set collection thing because I feel like if anyone has ever learned like something like Rummy when they were younger, mm -hmm. or any version of it really, you can kind of use Put that, that as a basis to kind of teach these next level uh, games that have something like that. So, yeah, Jaipur, great two player game. If you've never heard of it before, go pick it up. It's probably pretty cheap. And the new one looks, I think, even nicer than the other one. So we'll see. Stepped up their game a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, on to the second pick here. What's number two on your list? So the second one I picked is a heavy one. It's Thunderstone Quest. Ooh, okay. And that's a little bit of a bigger, it's a deeper game. It's not a beginner game. Um, but I really like it, and I like to play it with my spouse because it builds. It's a game that has multiple um, scenarios. So as you start off, you'll play your basic game. You'll learn how it works. You'll kind of learn what the components can do, how the dungeon of it works. But then as you go along, there's more quests you can do, more monsters to attack. Um, so it builds. So it's a really hard one to play if you um, don't have someone you can consistently play with. Sure, sure. Uh, so it's a great one to play with a spouse or if you have, you know, like that best friend you're always playing games with. Um, it's a good one to open up because you could always teach someone else the game. But it's really hard to get too far into it unless you both know what's going on. Okay, okay. But I love it. So it's deck building again, mm -hmm. um, but it does bring in the components of having to have the goods that you have to get, of having to build the different heroes. So your hand matters, but you also have to strategize that worker placement of where are you going to go? What are you going to choose? Are you going to go to the dungeon or are you going to try to collect more things to help your odds out of conquering or beating the quest? Hmm. So can you then your character sort of carry over in this game? So they don't necessarily carry over, um, which is one thing I do find unfortunate in that series, is each time you play, you are starting your deck over because it's, again, you have your base cards that you okay. start every time with. Um, but what I do find with it is that you find certain of the characters work better for you. Um, kind of, if you've played, as I think it's small... Small worlds. Small if you play small world? and stuff. Um, and so when you're... No, that's not... Smash up, sorry. Smash up, I didn't ah, think of what it was. Yeah, yeah. So when you're like, oh, wait, when you combine that, yeah. Yes, and so you kind of learn like, hey, the zombies lurk really well with the leprechauns or, you know, things like that. And this is the same way where you start to realize, you know, I'd rather collect from this hero type or from this weapon type because it works really well together. Whereas if I try to go from two different areas that I don't know that much about or mm -hmm. I know they're kind of weaker in this strength, then you may not have as much much success in the campaign. Yeah, I do have favorites with it, um, but I also like that it's one of those because each quest is a different type of um, achievement. You're trying to have a different goal okay. with it. Um, then it also kind of makes you have to learn about the other ones. You can't just only pick one and always play it and not pay attention to anything else because sure. later on you may have a different goal and what you prefer may not ever achieve that goal that way. So hmm. it's kind of cool in that instance. Um, but it's you can play up to four players with it. 
but I actually like it better as a two, maybe three player game only because there is so much involved and it would take a really long time for your turn to come around. Sure. Um, because it's the decision making part of it. It's a thinker. So you need yeah. time and you don't want to wait for too many other people to have that much time. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it's, yeah, it's definitely more involved than like we were saying at Dominion where, I mean, you sometimes your turn could be like less than a minute, right? Like 30 seconds. Right. Yeah. Got this, bought that done your turn. Um, yeah, right. I, I've not played that one. I've I've heard a lot about it though. I, I know a lot of people do like it, mm -hmm. so that's a that's an interesting pick. I may have to check that one out. There are several expansions for that, I believe. Right? There's all kinds of expansions. Yeah. It's kind of it reminds me a little bit of Midgard. I don't know if you've ever played that one, um, but it's the same kind of a thing where it's basically a series where there's some standalone <clears> versions, <throat> and then there's also the base and uh, Thunderstone itself is the base version okay. thunderstone quest is another version but it's it's complete standalone game and the box itself i mean it weighs a ton of weight it's a <laughs> giant box so you need lots of shelf space for it but there's at least three or four different quests within that one game so that it's a good one to buy to start i would think yeah sounds like you get good value out of that for sure yeah well speaking of a game that has several expansions that are also standalones uh, my next pick here is the Disney line of villainous games. Now, we just recently got more into this game. We had the base game for a while, and it it's it sat on the shelf for a good bit. Finally played it, liked it okay, didn't love it. Um, and then, go <laughs> again, we were talking about Amazon before. I mean, there's <laughs> always a sale on villainous at Target or always on it. You know, we got the expansions. I think one of them was like nine bucks or something after like nice. a coupon and <laughs> almost like 12 it's like why not buy these but yeah we went from like zero to all of them in a, in a mm -hmm. relatively short period of time so obviously our our taste our taste on this has grown to to like it a lot um i do like it at two i've only played it at two i will say mm -hmm. i i don't know if i will enjoy it with three or four mm -hmm. You know, in this game, you're doing a lot of blocking, right? Because on your turn, you're basically choosing one of these locations in front of you. Uh, by the way, if you've never heard of this game before, you're playing as one of the classic Disney villains trying to complete a nefarious plot that is unique to every character, which is great. And then those characters also have a, a fate deck, which are all the good guys, the heroes in that uh, storyline that are played against you. And so you're just moving around your little locations, doing different actions at each one, and your opponent can play these fake cards on you, which will partially block some of the actions at these locations, which can be quite frustrating. Because of that, though, I feel like it plays well at two. You don't feel like you're getting picked on or that you're picking on someone because there's only one person to mess with, right? So you can't really get, I mean, you can feel bad about it, but you can't get angry about it because what choice do they have? Um, and it's not a it's not a quick game by any means, you know. I, I think when it first came out, I feel like it might have had that sort of oh, here's a Disney game like oh, magical, you know, princessy thing. But it's pretty heavy. It's pretty strategic. Yeah, I was not into villainous when it first came out. I usually avoid all movie thematic type games because mm -hmm. I feel like it's a game made because there's a movie. Right. Um, not necessarily a game. And we had friends that bought it. They tried to play it and they couldn't figure it out. So they called and said, hey, can you try this one out and see what you think? And we are huge Villainous fans at our house. We own them all. Um, I actually would recommend you play it with more people. Um, we do. Uh, one of the things, and I don't remember if it's an actual rule or just the rule we play it by, but we always say you can't fate the same person um, repeatedly so if you get faded then it has to go to someone else okay. before it can go back to you so that kind of keeps at least the kids you know from getting felt picked on yeah 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 for sure a, but i oh. think it is a i mean it's disney art that actually reflects disney it's beautiful game um and then the characters just i mean trying to achieve those objectives are harder than and you read some of them uh yeah. cruella deville comes to mind super simple goal right you're collecting the puppies it's all you got to do but i swear it is impossible to get those dogs or impossible to keep them without yeah. everything someone does to you takes away those dogs from yep. you so i have not 
had much success with her or uh, my favorite is Radigan. I love that character because I love that movie. Okay. Um, but I can't win with him. It is, it is a tough, it's a tough objective, but it's a great game. It's especially great for people because the explanation of it is really, there is no explanation. You have to read your own character, yeah. know what your objective is. But I like it because with kids or people that don't love games, they can show you the cards and what everything they're doing only affects them outside of fake cards. Sure. So if they have a question about it, they can ask, you know, hey, what do I do with this card or what should I do with this? And you can answer it, but it's not anything that's going to now hinder their game because right. I don't get an advantage over knowing they have that. Right. So I think I feel like especially, you know, a Ravensburger, you know, themed game for a movie villainous hit it out of the park for me absolutely and there's there's obviously no end in sight for <laughs> for expansions oh. i mean there's i'm waiting be a... for the fairy tale side now let's switch it from villains you know to, to hero they'll probably come out with the other side at some yeah. point <laughs> yeah that's probably true i've actually yet to win this game <laughs> so it is it is not easy um prince john that's the key if you well, give me prince yeah. john i've heard that's the easy one <laughs> that's my wife won as prince john i think the first time we played i think i had heard that too which is why i purposely avoided him um but i played his hook the first time i don't remember how again i didn't i didn't do well and then i also played as the queen of hearts which was okay again a very you know specific you had to get this set up in the mm -hmm. locations and then play this one card that you get the chance to win maybe <laughs> it's not even like you win and i had all my my dudes lined up and i took the shot and i didn't get it and i think every time we've played this game my wife lauren has won by like the the that next turn mm -hmm. like i was gonna win on the next turn is what is what i mean and I always just stop paying attention to what she's doing for one turn. And that's been the death of me every single time. So I got to get refocused. I got to find the character I think that I'm good at. And if I win. To I'm connect with it. one of them. Yeah, yeah. And it's a strange one, though. I find no matter how many people we have playing, and we've played up to six. Six is a lot. I will feel like the turns take too long. Um, but I think yeah. four is great. Um, but I, we find it's always a slow start. But everybody comes close to winning right about at the same time so it's almost worse because you have that chance and you just can't make it ex and any of those characters like you were saying with hook where or um the queen of hearts where you have to show where you're at so maleficent's the same way you have to kind of show what cards you have underneath everyone can see how close you are right right right, right. they attack you know and so if we fate those people all you know every time whereas if you have someone um i can't remember what the villain's name is but um he's from princess and the frog if you oh, play um, him, Facilier? F yes, Dr. Yeah. Facilier. Yeah, yeah. Um, nobody, you know, he's total luck. It's whether or not you draw the right card, but nobody knows where you are in the game with it. So it's a great okay. one to not get faded all that much because people don't know where you're at. And Maleficent, we know exactly where they're at. So we go right for them. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, definitely want to get this one back to the table sooner than later. Excellent. Um, do you have the Marvel villainous? So I don't. I've been looking at that one um, because I'm not my. I have three boys, so you would think I would have gotten the Marvel one yet. But because I have all the other ones, I haven't bought that one yet. But I'd be interested in seeing if there's any differences from the base villainous, or if it's the same just with the Marvel characters. I, I think there is a. I actually own it. I got it for Christmas. Uh -huh. Haven't played it yet. <clears throat> from what I understand, I think there is difference enough that you can't combine characters with the other games whatever which i is. actually kind of like because i do love having the villain set but yeah i would like to see the game take a, a you know a little bit of a turn i agree i agree all right so that's my number two we're getting to the end here usually the list would be over by now folks but because <laughs> it's mother's day we're celebrating going that extra mile i'm gonna do it a third pick so callie what is the third pick for spouse games so my third one is probably one a mother wouldn't normally pick, but it's Abomination. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've heard of this one, mm -hmm. but it is definitely more on the gothic end of art. It's very macabre um, design style, but I love this game and I love it as a two player game. Um, we've played with two to four, um, but it's a long game. And so sure. the more people you have, 
um, the longer the game takes. And there is enough worker placement that I feel like two people, you still feel like you're playing the game, not just we're both grabbing because there was nobody playing. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But it's a really neat one um, as far as if you're wanting something different because it plays in stages. So your stage one is obviously going to be your worker placement. You're going to be going about collecting your cards, collecting, and in this particular game, different body parts, um, organs, bones, tissues, whatever you're going for, because you're trying to build up the character of Frankenstein. Um, so it makes you visit different areas along this um, European map. And as you're doing it um, and collecting your points, you have to also keep in mind that you're going to have to keep them fresh um, or they will decay as the game goes on. So it <laughs> makes you think about what you're doing. Um, it's probably the only game, you know, where murder is encouraged, you know, kind of a thing. Um, and depending on who your player card is, which is a luck draw um, element to it, okay. um, can also affect, you know, your strategy um, because it does have, the other element to it, which is you have your three different areas of life. So humanity and you have your intellectualism um, and you're trying to grow those, but finding a balance because if you spend too much time with them, then you can't collect enough of the body parts. So hmm. it's a really interesting give and take as far as trying to keep up that humanity, which allows you to get extra points at the end of the game, allows you to be able to have an extra worker to place. Um, different things like that. But if you spend too much time worrying about that, then you never get to build Frankenstein. And that's the whole point of the game um, initially is to build him. And then you move into stage two, which of course is where you're putting the body parts together in order to create Frankenstein. And then stage three brings in that luck element of now dice are involved. You have to roll and you have to hope you roll the right things to activate it. Otherwise they can completely undo everything you've just strived the whole game to do which is build that monster. Um, and the game can end one of two ways. You either build and activate your monster first, which is your obvious goal because then just you get to really take on that victory. Mm -hmm. Or if it doesn't, which in most cases it doesn't because they're really hard to do, then it ends into whoever has the most victory points. And that's all based on where you got your body parts from, how fresh you kept them, and how much of it you're able to activate. So... Another game that has just multiple avenues that you can win. And I love games like that where you can still have a chance even if you didn't follow one particular path to victory. Yeah, for sure. For sure. This one sounds really thematic. Yeah. Um, I, I, knew it, I knew what it was about, but I didn't know it went that far in terms of <laughs> preserving the, uh, the, the parts. Yes. So it is not the, pretty. <laughs> yeah. It, is, is the artwork like pretty graphic in the game too? So it is um, graphic in the sense of, I mean, your the body parts themselves are just cubes. So you have uh, like white cubes for bones or red cubes for blood. Um, but the actual Frankenstein parts do come, you have it all, you know, arms, legs, torso, head. And, you know, that's kind of gruesome and stuff. So if you, especially if you're thinking kids, you know, maybe not if they're super sensitive to things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for teenagers, you know, it's kind of, it brings that cool element, you know, they like to kind of see that it's a little bit bloody, a little bit gory, kind of a look to it, but there's nothing particularly gruesome about the game other than you are putting those parts together to build right. on the table, this Frankenstein character and every um, person playing does have to build a character. Is that gotcha. in front of them, but it gotcha. is definitely very macabre. Look, it's a darker board, um, darker cards, um, things like that. So it, it definitely plays towards that element. Cool. Sounds great for uh, for Halloween time for sure. That's exactly when we got it. Was yeah, it was awesome. about Halloween time, and we thought, you know, why not? <laughs> so I'm um, I'm. Um... It's interesting that that was your last pick. We did not know our picks beforehand, by the way, folks. Um, but my last one is is really in the same vein. And that is the game Horrified, which is my co-op pick here. Uh, definitely some Frankenstein going on there as well. Much less gruesome, it sounds like, though, than, <laughs> than your pick. But, you know, this game has all the classic universal monsters, Frankenstein and the Bride, uh, the Mummy, Werewolf, Invisible Man, Dracula, and Creature from the Black Lagoon, I believe. And they all play differently. So you're playing against these monsters, um, infinite like replayability in this game because you're going to have a different character that has a different special ability. But the monsters you play against, you can play against one or two or three, or I guess all of them if you really were crazy, but they all have a different sort of win condition. So they 
the game does a great job of using the same basic mechanic of really just going to locations on the map and collecting resources of three different colors but they utilize those in so many different ways for these monsters to the point where you don't feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again um this is great for two players i think because you get to scale the game like i said set the difficulty level and you really feel accomplished when you you achieve those things even if you don't win right if you're playing against three monsters and you beat two out of three of them it's like all right you know we gave it a valiant effort we did the best we could and uh, we just we didn't come out on top today and, that, and that's okay i like when co-op games have a good balance of i don't want to win every time i don't want to lose every time I don't want to feel like it's too easy or too hard and horrified because of the way you can change it up. I think just is the perfect fit. I really have been recommending this one to people for a long time now. In fact, my wife and I actually gifted it, it to uh, my, my brother-in-law for his birthday, uh, which is today. So, uh, oh, happy birthday. so yeah, we uh, were slowly, slowly um, changing them into a board gaming family without <laughs> them really realizing it. So there's that. Uh, but you guys probably have this one as well, right? We do. So I, I was telling you earlier, I'm not normally a co-op fan. Um, I tend to avoid them because I am a every man for themselves type of winner. But um, my husband picked that one up. Um, he was really excited about it. We played it once and I think we had two monsters and I think it was probably Frankenstein and the creature from the Blue Lagoon or something. Um, and we hated it. It was too easy. We beat it really quickly. And I was just like, it just proved my point. I was like, this is the worst game ever. Um, we, <laughs> and Seb, I was never going to, I was like, it's shelved. We're done. We're not seeing this one again. But he convinced me to get it out again. And this time we mixed up and I think we did three monsters and we lost horribly. It was so challenging and we could not make headway. We just kept losing. And then we probably went on about two months of constantly bringing it to the table, constantly losing. And our only goal was to figure out how to beat those three monsters. And when we finally did, we were super excited until we realized, well, there's still more monsters you know, that we have to do. So I think that it's a great game, um, even if you're not a co-op fan, because um, you can separate where you're doing one thing. You're trying to accomplish one of the monsters while yeah. the other person is trying to defeat the other monster, meanwhile protecting each other. So you still feel like you're playing your own game. You don't feel like you're just playing a game as somebody else is telling you how to move or what to yeah, do. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah, and, and then at the same time, like you said, there's infinite. I mean, there's so many different monsters and the variety of how you play them. Um, and then also what character you ended up with and what abilities you have yep. changes the dynamic every time. Yeah, and I love the artwork on this game. The board, yes. I don't. there was something about it just... You open it and you lay it out. It just it looks like a game that I would have had when I was younger if it existed. <laughs> if that makes any definitely sense, I don't know. It's definitely a throwback style looking game. <laughs> it is. It is, and just that whole that whole mechanic of just like I said, collecting those things from different locations doesn't change without right. with each scenario. But how you implement them and what they're what they're used for is different, and that's just that's brilliant. Um, and the I people, I love the little ones. characters that come with it. Yeah, and stuff yeah. that you have to collect and. Worrying it now, you're worrying about these pedestrians, you know, that are in the street. They're just like, wait a minute, I have this objective, but darn it, I have to go bring this, you know, little old lady here who has to come along with me. Yeah, <laughs> before the Wolfman gets to her, for sure. Yes. Great. Awesome. Well, I think that's three picks from each of us, if I my math is correct. Um, Callie, I want to thank you for agreeing to uh, to take some time out of your day to chat with me here about games that you enjoy to play with your spouse and telling us a little bit about your family. Um, is there anything in particular you'd like to add before we sort of coast off here? No, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. And we love board games. And I think the best thing is, is with families, you know, board games are the perfect thing to always have around because especially with this pandemic happening, I mean, I couldn't have been more grateful that we had a great stock of games and kept the kids busy because they're online all the time. Right, and right. so board games are such a great way to incorporate the kids, the family, the spouse, whoever, um, into something that kind of gets them off the screen. They get to you know learn, engage, and it's always something fun for everyone to get to do. It's Yeah, it is a great hobby, and uh, we're very lucky to have it. So that's going to wrap things up here, folks. Make sure you give this video a thumbs up. 
And hey, you should be subscribed by now to Board Game Dads. If not, you should go ahead and remedy that right now. And I highly encourage you to go check out Callie on Instagram. She's at AZ Game Mom, and she'll always be talking about uh, games or cookies or donuts or gardens. Amongst no shortage of food topics. <laughs> awesome. All right, folks. Thanks for joining us. And uh, oh, in the comments below, let us know what games you enjoy playing with your significant other. I'd love to hear some of those. All right, folks. Have a great night. We'll see you next time. Bye.